Yeah. Right, I'm starting because it's a minute, it's two minutes past. So let's get going. And Stephanie, if you could let people in as they arrive. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, so hello and welcome to Liverpool Salon. Um, I'm Pauline Hadaway. I'm one of the uh, co-founders really, and founder member and also the convener of the Liverpool Salon. And I'd like to welcome you to this event, which is called Welcome Back America. I'm going to introduce you in a moment to our panel. Um, we've got a fantastic panel as, who we're going to really, I guess, explore the outlook for the Joe Biden presidency. But our starting point for the discussion really was um, uh, the Biden's claim of the claim that was made that um, that the which was made really throughout the election campaign and also in the president's inaugural speech that America was back and that um, it was ready to engage with the world. And this theme really has been repeated again and again in numerous speeches and picked up by political leaders all over the world in Europe. And it's often um, as it was in February in the speech in Biden's speech to the Munich um, Security Conference, it's often linked to a warning, a threat, an idea of a threat to democracy or to freedom or to some value that America represents. And um, I think that the claim of Biden's administration that it represents a return to normal services certainly speaks of this um, hope that Trump was a sort of a, 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 um, a, a blip, a temporary break in normal transmission. And that really raised the question, I think, that we started with at the Liverpool Salon that we wanted to dis discuss, and that is, what is normal? What is a return to normal? What would that look like beyond the rhetoric? What would it actually look like? But we're also interested, I think, in the theme of the rhetoric itself. So the rhetoric's both a kind of mask or something that we want to find what's behind the rhetoric. But also I think um, perhaps it masks a, a lack of confidence or a disorientation. Or what I think is really fascinating idea is that the belief in American exceptionalism, the belief that America can come back and kind of save the world is really a, 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 a speaks to a sort of conjuring up of a, of a reality that, um, that exerts a power and influence of its own. So we're interested both in the rhetoric and the reality and the way they work together. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers in the order that we've asked them to speak. I'm just going to give a really short introduction to each of them, relatively short, so we can get on with the discussion. And there are longer biographies on the Liverpool Salon website. So first up, going through all my bits of paper is Liam Kennedy. Hi, Liam. Liam Hi. is director of the Clinton Institute for American Studies at, the, at University College Dublin. And he has a very diverse range of research interests and teaching experiences that span the fields of American cultural and media studies, globalization and Irish-US Irish relations and he's the author or editor of numerous books, most recently, Neoliberalism and American Literature and Trump's America. And Professor Kennedy is actually a founding editor of America Unfiltered, which I highly recommend. It's a media platform for commentary on contemporary American foreign policy, politics, and media. After that, we will be asking Philip Cunliffe to speak, and Philip, is a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at the University of Kent. He's written widely on a variety of political issues ranging from Balkan politics to Brexit, a particular focus on questions of sovereignty and international politics in the 21st century. And his most recent books include The New 20 Years Crisis, A Critique of International Relations, 1999 to 2019, and Cosmopolitan Dystopia, International Intervention and the Failure of the West. I can recommend them both. Our third speaker is Jacob Reynolds. And Jacob is Partnership Manager at the Academy of Ideas. And he works in strategic, as a strategic consultant. 
And Jacob read um, philosophy at St. Cross College, Oxford, where he developed a special interest in political philosophy and continental philosophy, especially the work of Hannah Arendt. And prior to Oxford, Jacob read politics and philosophy at the University of Sheffield, where, and this is the really important bit, he was part of a group of, uh, the, of friends who ran the Sheffield Salon. And so welcome, Jacob, as a fellow Salonista, um, you're very welcome here. He spends his spare time drinking coffee, or oh, drinking coffee, writing <laughs> about literature and arguing about philosophy. Nice to see you there. And finally, um, our fourth speaker is Cheryl Hudson, and Cheryl is a lecturer in the US political history here at the University of Liverpool. Her research focuses on the histories of race, reform and political culture in the United States. She is co-editor of Ronald Reagan and the 1980s. And her book, Citizenship in Chicago, Race, Culture and the Remaking of American Identity, 1890 to 1930 is out soon. Looking forward to that. So let's start. Liam, would you like to make some opening um, give us an opening introduction on your take on the discussion. I, I will. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for putting all of this together. Um, I must say, I, I, I wasn't expecting to do an introduction in terms of any coherence, so I won't. I'll simply give you a couple of thoughts around this title of America is Back. Um, when I first came across the title, uh, which itself is very old, other political campaigns have used it, but whenever Biden began to use it over a year ago, I thought, no, no, don't use this, pull it back, this is a mistake. But they just got louder and louder with this, and, and then when Biden won, we find it was being splashed all over the place. And uh, as I think you said there, it was utilized very recently at the Munich Security Conference, um, which was held virtually this year, but a very important gathering um, of European leaders and American leaders, and an opportunity usually to think what sort of state is transatlantic relations in. So America is back. What does it mean? Well, first of all, let's take the question back to what. Um, it seems to me part of the danger with this phrase is it, it constitutes a kind of nostalgia or at least a desire for a return to normalcy. Um, I understand that desire. I have it myself. I have four and a half years of Trump. Anybody would want to go back to normalcy. But the idea of going back in time to a kind of reset of American foreign policy, of America's international relations, is crazy. It's just not going to happen for a number of reasons. First of all, we'd have to question whether it's worth going back. Um, I think American foreign policy and America's relationships with the world before Donald Trump arrived were really not that great. Um, and we shouldn't somehow look at it as a golden age we wish to return to. You know, American led, or led a liberal world order since the Second World War, which did a lot of bad in the world as well as a lot of good. So let's not lionize it through nostalgia. That would be a bad mistake. Um, Trump, of course, uh, took a wrecking ball to all of that, uh, hasn't fully succeeded, and it is important that the United States reconstructs its international relations. And I think in many ways we see that Biden's going about the, uh, that in a way that Europeans in particular would like to see. It looks like he may be trying to reconstruct a liberal world order. At the same time, this sense of um, inducing some kind of normalcy, um, I think, has to be resisted. The world is not what it was, and it's not just because the world moved on over four and a half years. It's because the United States let it. Um, Trump was absolutely a derelict in terms of international engagement. One could say much worse than that. We know that he pulled the United States out of many multilateral agreements, a number of which now Biden is scrambling to get the US back into. But what he really did most profoundly is he destroyed the trust around the world that the United States was a country one could turn to in a time of danger or crisis, as, for example, might happen with something like a pandemic in which, of course, the United States took no leadership whatsoever around the globe. So that dereliction is very, very damaging. It means that the trust in the idea of America has been damaged. I don't take that lightly. I think part of the power of the United States over the last 45 years has been its uh, soft power, uh, the sense that it is an asylum nation. Look what it's doing now around immigration. Um, those ideas have been trashed by Trump, and they're not going to be rebuilt by Joe Biden in a few months. The other reason that Biden can't rebuild this is very simple. Um, the most powerful ideological and political forces in Europe right now are not liberal, they're ethno-nationalist. Um, and that's chiming with a large part of his own 
you know, the United States electorate as well. Um, Biden's biggest problem around the world is getting America right, and he knows it. We know from Jake Sullivan, his national security advisor, that every time Biden has gone on a call to a world leader in the last three weeks, he starts the call by saying, I know our country has to be sorted out. I will do this. In other words, he understands entirely that people now look at the United States through the lens of Trumpism and through, my final point here, the fear that Trump or many Trump will return. So if you're going around the world as Biden or a member of his team and saying America is back, European leaders and other leaders are looking at you and saying, yeah, for how long? What happens in four years time? And that's a good question. I'd be asking it if I was a leader as well. Thanks very much, Liam. Thank you. That's great. That's a really great start to kind of setting out the um, um, the, the problems that are facing um, uh, Biden in in pursuing this uh, um, hope of a return to normal. Um, Bill, can I ask you to come in? Absolutely. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be um, at the Liverpool Salon. Unfortunately, not in Liverpool, but. Um, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully in hopefully in future. So the answer to the question is America back. I think the answer was received on the 25th of February um, with the bombing of pro-government militias in Syria. So a country the US is not formally at war with um, because these pro-government militias um, allegedly attacked US forces deployed in Syria. So that the US is effectively occupying a sliver of Syrian territory with its own forces bombing the country that it's not formally at war with. And this was less than a month in office, uh, beating Trump's record of four months before Trump engaged in military action of a similar sort. So all the characteristics of the forever war are there. Um, the Syrian civil war has lasted 10 years and that 10 years um, had been prolonged as a result of outside interference, which includes the US support for um, the anti-regime anti factions. The bombing undertaken by the US previously and now by Biden as well indicates the exercise of executive privilege to defend occupying fun countries, like I say, in a country the US has not even formally declared war on. And this needs, I think, to be understood um, this needs to be understood with, against and with all the talk of renewing multilateralism, international cooperation, alliances and shared values. And this is what it means effectively in this case is unrestrained power that recognizes no external limit. There is no um, political, there is no pol political, politically legitimate alternative to American power. So the only barrier to the exercise of American power is other power itself. Um, they avoid, you know, they will avoid going into conflict which will risk um, greater conflict up to that point, but otherwise they recognize no external limit on their power, whether it's legal, political, or the rights of other nations to um, be free from external interference. And there's also no internal check on that power. Um, that Biden has moved so swiftly to exercise the presidential, the executive discretion of the office and to use force in this manner indicates his um, willingness to show that independence of any kind of legislative or other kind of oversight. It's a reassertion not only of the presidency, but also of the U.S. security state, um, that vision of the of um, a U.S apparatus that is independent of the formal political structures of US government, in fact, a deep state that exercise that can exercise power independently of the formal representative structures and legal structures of US government. So obviously, the, uh, in respect of the question, is America back, you could also say it never really left. Um, and that President Trump was able to style himself as an anti-war president only speaks to the fact of just how belligerent um, U.S. foreign policy had become in the last 30 years and the need to demonstrate the difference that Biden feels the need to demonstrate the difference with Trump um, and to cast Trump as such an abominable departure from the usual routine. I think this is likely to propel the Biden administration into further foreign adventurism of this sort, which is to say essentially military belligerence with no rationale, no end point, no real goal ultimately just war for the sake of war itself. And I'll finish on this point, I suppose, which is um, 
this question of America returning to its position of global leadership, I think is an important one because I think the one of the most important aspects of American power is that the American state has effectively served as a backstop to political and social order around the world for the last 30 years, which means that everyone around the world thinks in terms of um, American politics and American power. And I think that in itself is not only um, dangerous insofar as it's predicated on involving the American state in all sorts of political situations around the world, but also that it diminishes our political will and capacity to resolve our problems independently of American power. So this notion that there is always that every decision that we make and that America is ultimately the guarantor of our politics, of our societies, um, of our everyday lives, ultimately, it's a very pernicious notion, I think. And I think the spell has been broken to that extent and that Biden will not be able to bring it back. So the scenes of the Capitol riot when Trump supporters stormed the Capitol um, around the time of the around the time of the inauguration and the run up to the inauguration um, and the kind of the seismic shock that this gave to the American political class and um, American liberals in particular. I think this um, it's had a effect, a Wizard of Oz effect, where you have the pulling back of the curtain at the end of the film of the Wizard of Oz and beneath all the dramatic kind of flames and images, um, it's just an elderly man cranking mechanical levers that are malfunctioning. And I think this, if I think that we will, once you've seen that, once the curtain's been pulled back, it's very difficult to recreate the um, impression of power. And that seems to me something which is um, positive even if it will take time perhaps to work itself out. But the fact that there is um, perhaps a growing suspicion, even if only a sneaking one, that we can't ultimately rely on American power to resolve our own problems and to watch over our shoulders, that seems to me to be a positive. So I'll leave it there. I look forward to everyone's questions and the debate. Thank you, Phil. That's brilliant. That's uh, a, a, a really nice um, contribution there. And I'm going to move on now to Jacob and ask you, would you um, tell us what you think? Yeah, sure. I'm, I feel the need to preface what I'm going to say. Saying I've, I've always thought of myself as something as of an American father, been inspired by various ideals and indeed some of the reality of uh, America. But um, I, I feel the need to look reality in the face. And if we had more time, what I wanted to do was take you through uh, almost an alternative state of the union where we could chronicle the many symptoms of American dysfunction from the poverty to the political failure to the economic stagnation uh, to the pervasive sense of helplessness. So, but instead, um, I'll, want, I'll just make do by suggesting that people go on Twitter and check out this almost like genre that's emerged of people driving around California, the state with a higher GDP than all but three countries. Um, and just driving around recording the endless shanty towns multiplying on the sides of highways. Um, and it was this dysfunction, as has been suggested, that Donald Trump in his own way kind of reflected very well. I won't go further into it because the question for us today is uh, Biden and why Biden won and what it all means. Now, on the one hand, there's a logic, I guess, to that fever pitch of dysfunction being followed by a kind of exhaustion and Biden appropriately enough uh, given his senility rep represented to the American people a kind of afternoon nap. Um, and on the other hand, he's of course the embodiment of the success of uh, putting Trumpism and the broader, however imperfect populist project as it were, back in its box. Now, some people have taken this to mean that Biden, even if uninspiring, represents a kind of renewed class assertiveness amongst the American oligarchy. Indeed, the establishment does seem again to be able to set somewhat the tone of American politics and push the contradictions reflected by Trump uh, behind uh, the curtain whilst the crumbling outside continues. In a way, was this not captured so wonderfully in the response of Biden's press secretary uh, to a question about what Joe Biden had done uh, for workers? And she noted how all the workers in America can feel safe knowing that he's appointed some women to the business council. 
There was also, of course, that uh, viral tweet from one of those uh, brunch loving DC types saying how it feels so wonderful to have military action under Biden because it's so calm and measured and presumably without the vulgar displays and oversized American flags that Trump would have accompanied it with. And if that wasn't enough, because we had the news that the uh, policy of keeping immigrant kids in cages was continuing, only now it's all okay because they're temporary confinement facilities and not cages. So in other words, Biden's not merely more of the same for the American establishment, but a relatively effective way of almost literally redressing the failures of American politics and economy. He's put new clothes on those old symbols of American power. But I do think it's just that, new clothes, a facade. Um, behind all that, the economy continues to stagnate and no amount of stimulus will change that. The war machine carries on spinning itself into the ground. The money printing continues. The credit markets keep swelling. Um, increasingly, the estrangement of large sections of even the ruling class continues. And for many Americans, a pervasive set of hopelessness um, digs in. Now, pretending things are all right, as the Biden administration sort of wants to do, or putting a nice lick of paint on things, inevitably buries problems and stores up trouble. To see unity, you hide division. To see prosperity, you hide poverty. To see greatness, you have to hide decline. And by the way, as if to uh, hammer home the point about American decline, there was that brilliant story of China offering a, an apology for accidentally um, conducting some anal swab COVID tests on the American WHO representatives and investigators. So it's kind of this, the uh, fundamental superficiality of American politics and its inability to get to the bottom of things that Biden represents. Now, it's hardly like the right has an alternative. The storming of the Capitol, which Phil's alluded to, um, there wasn't just a gross act of anti-democratic lawlessness but it revealed this like facade-like nature of American politics, and in this case, the inability of the right uh, to see it. So in storming the Capitol, what was achieved, right? Um, there was an almost charming naivety on behalf of the protesters involved. It was like, oh, well, this is where power's exercised. If we go there, then maybe we'll make some change. But really, they stormed a fairy tale castle. Not only was no one guarding it, there was, no, there was nothing there. If they were looking for power, well, power in America is exercised elsewhere. The home of American democracy was just a sham, a load of terrified preeners hiding behind their desks or cowering in buildings across the road. Phil must have tweeted this, I've written down as well, the, wiz, the wiz, was the Wizard of Oz moment. They went in there, pulled back the curtain, and there was only a terrified pretender uh, there. So getting to grips with American dysfunction requires something more far-reaching, and I don't think there's much sign of that on the horizon. Uh, the late Soviet scenario, scenario a rotting society which the elites have no interest in or even idea of, and those brave enough to understand what's going on more likely to opt out and detach from society, whether literally or ironically, that to me seems more likely. Now, putting aside, and I'll end on this, putting aside the prospect of some sort of uh, democratic awakening, one alternative was sketched out in that uh, film, much maligned film from 2019, Joker, and the film was above all about the inability to carry on, the failure to continue maintaining the facade, the point where you couldn't keep up the act any longer. And this was why, along with the prospect of civil disobedience by the wrong sorts of people, the American elite had such a strong instinctive aversion to that film. It raised the alarm. There's a violence that brews, the film tells us, the longer you are forced to smile. And eventually, and this is the danger, eventually it spills out. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Jacob. Great. Cheryl, can you round us off? And after Cheryl, uh, people could start thinking of, um, you know, of what they'd like to, um, to, to contribute to the discussion, either by way of questions, which you can send through the um, question um, function or the chat function, or you can just raise your hand maybe and we'll bring you in. Uh, you may have a comment you'd like to add. We'll go out into the audience after uh, we've heard from Cheryl. Cheryl. Thank you, Pauline. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying the uh, the Wizard of Oz analogies, and I was just wondering whether Kamala Harris kind of sees herself as Dorothy. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there's so much to say, and um, I, you know, I I really kind of found it hard to uh, kind of think about how I'm going to organise my thoughts. I'm going to. Well, I'm 
I'm going to concentrate on. And I thought, since we are talking about America, really, I'm going to kind of try and organize my thoughts around um, three themes, freedom, equality, and democracy. And I think that, you know, those three values are, of course, you know, the founding values of the American nation, and they are enduring liberal values. Um, but it has become increasingly clear that um, while American political leaders do pay these values lip service, uh, the political culture has deteriorated to, uh, to such an extent that few people really believe in or uphold those values anymore, um, however much they profess to. So in fact, the more they lay claim to them, um, the quicker they are willing really to run roughshod over them. So I think that while it's important to shine a light on the rhetorical emptiness of liberal values today. It's really important to do that. It's also important to uphold the real achievements that they represent in, in human, not to mention American history. Um, so, for, so we take freedom, first of all, in the 1930s, FDR promised Americans freedom from fear. Indeed, um, that all Americans had to fear was fear itself. But in the US today, when the future looks uncertain and there's a kind of unwillingness to live with any form of uncertainty, whether that's about the environment, whether it's about the virus, whether it's about immigration, or frankly, whether it's about the actions of other Americans, you know, right across the political spectrum, there's a tendency towards dispensing with freedom and embracing fear and reaching for authoritarian measures. So, you know, Biden literally campaigned on locking the country down and recently damned those states um, for opening up and lifting mask mandates um, as Neanderthals, um, which, you know, seems to me to undermine his claims to want to reunify the nation. Um, I, expect he, I suspect that he means that, you know, we can unify when you idiots stop acting like the deranged morons you clearly are and adopt my worldview. Um, free speech isn't faring well in Biden's America with uh, Mr. Potato Head, Dr. Seuss and Pepe Le Pew recently coming under intense scrutiny and censorship. Not to mention the fact that the former president Trump has be been disappeared from various social media platforms. Free assembly is also being challenged in the response to the January 6th riot under the cover of proposed anti-terrorist crackdowns, which you know, already has Washington DC placed indefinitely under martial law on the basis of chatter on social media. Um, and, you know, the exaggerations <clears throat> and the distortions of the reporting of that January the 6th insurrection or supposed attempted coup by the press suggests that there won't be a free press in the next four years either or a press holding power to account Instead, you know, they're kind of adopting a, um, a fawning or cheerleading attitude towards coverage of uh, the Biden administration, most of which strikes you as fake, um, because at least, you know, there was a kind of authenticity or plausibility when they talked so highly of Obama. But, you know, Biden and Harris are so dull, you know, and they are such hacks that the mainstream press, um, you know, seem ridiculous in kind of preparing this narrative of them as liberal woke saviors. Um, I suppose bombing Libya kind of spiced things up nicely for them on that score. So freedom of speech, freedom of assembly and a free press are, you know, just some of the freedoms that I think are going to be eroded in the next four years and undermined and, um, you know, all while the US claims to be spreading its values around the world. The second value um, that I mentioned is equality. Um, Americans, you know, are more divided than ever, but the fantasy divisions of the culture wars are foremost in the headlines, while very little is said or done about the real divisions that are rooted in the inequalities of the American economy and society. The divisions between the haves and the have nots, and especially between, you know, the rural and the urban populations and between um, blacks and whites. So since 2008, you know, there's been a um, K-shaped recovery with the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. I think this is going to be exaggerated more with COVID. Um, so while the cities are recovering, rural and small town areas aren't. Um, there's been a lot of agricultural 
extractive and manufacturing jobs that have been lost um, and there's been no serious federal investment or anti-poverty initiatives in rural areas since Johnson's war on poverty in the 1960s. And there's been very little attention paid to black poverty either, um, you know, despite the BLM protests and everything. Um, but black unemployment and incarceration rates remain much higher than those of whites, um, although actually they both declined slightly under Trump. And it's unlikely that things are going to improve under Biden, to be honest. So um, given the fact that he was the author of the 1994 crime bill and, you know, Harris was a strong advocate and enforcer of the Clinton era lock them up policies. So there's very little concern or interest shown by the Biden administration in bridging the inequalities in American life. Um, there is instead, though, lots of worrying talk about equity as opposed to equality, um, which actually serves to obscure actual inequalities. So a shift that, um, that I think highlights the distance that social justice has traveled away from liberalism and from liberal values. And the responses to social inequality and especially to the political establishment's unwillingness or inability to address those inequalities has led to a lot of anger, to chaos, to disorder, and in the context of COVID, to political violence. And I mean both last summer's riots and the Capitol Hill riot in January, which brings us to democracy. And you know, the populism of both Trump and of Bernie Sanders, um, I think represented somewhat this rage and this kind of uh, demand for a change. Both of them had um, limited success, but ultimately failed because nothing has changed. So there remains, I think, a hankering and a need for change um, in the American population. And I think that it's hard to say where that is gonna go now. The Biden administration, meanwhile, has um, responded to the increased demand for popular democracy by issuing presidential orders at a record pace. So this is a really undemocratic trend and it tips the already skewed balance in favor of the White House and away from Congress. Um, and meanwhile, in Congress, the proposed uh, minimum wage hike to $15 an hour was taken down by a procedural ruling in the Senate and which Kamala Harris could have overturned but chose not to. And by the way, while Phil was speaking, I got a text in to say that the, um, the, the $1.9 trillion package has now passed the House, but without that $15 an hour um, pay hike. So just to conclude, America is back, make America great again. I think these are both slogans that represent the cry of a nation and an empire in decline. Um, I don't think it's quite a death rattle, but, um, but liberalism is waiting for the grave diggers to turn up while the corpse is decomposing. Um, and where are the grave diggers? As far as I can see, they're on Twitter fighting about Mr. Potato Head. Can't hear you, Pauline. Yeah, that's it. I'll read it now. Thanks again. Thank you, Cheryl. That was great. Um, before I go out um, and, and ask people for comments and, and questions, there was a couple of, um, of, of thoughts that, it, that have occurred to me when I was listening to all of these uh, presentations. And firstly, um, going back to, to uh, Liam and Phil, I mean, you both seem to be saying... Um, that, that things that the world has moved on in a way. You both seem to be suggesting that the America is back, uh, the rhetorical claim that it's back is gonna come up against a world that either, I think Liam, you, you, know, you were saying has lost trust or lost faith in the, in the promise of the United States as the sort of, um, it's the, the rescuer of the world. Um, and the, the, the leader, the, the moral and political and economic leader in the world, um, they don't trust that, they, they have lost faith in that. And Phil, I think you were saying, that's right, they have, and that's probably a good thing. Um, I just wanted to come back. Have I characterized that correctly, Liam? Is that your view that, that the world has kind of moved on? Yeah. And America is got, gonna have to run to catch up? 
I think so. I think the, 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 the so-called liberal world order has been in crisis for a long time. Transatlantic relations has been almost moribund for some time. Um, and of course, transatlantic relations are very much symbolized in this part of the world as somehow being at the center of uh, this concept of the West um, that we, we carry around with us I think, rather lazily at times. Um, I think that we uh, see the world opening up in all kinds of ways. It used to be um, rather casually described as the rise of the rest, <laughs> excuse me, as a way of suggesting that globalization was transforming so many geoeconomic and geopolitical relationships um, that it meant that relative power was accruing elsewhere. I think that's much too simple. I think there has been a huge dispersion of power over the last 30 or 40 years away from um, um, the hard politics and the hard power of the United States. Um, but nonetheless, and, and you can see that in different ways, that dispersal is into, you know, international government organizations, um, NGOs, and lots of other uh, um, organizations and networks are carrying uh, various kinds of relative power. So it does mean that nation states, I think, are on the back foot in all kinds of ways and trying to rethink, um, you know, how they function. Um, globalization has uh, stuttered, to put it very mildly, and, and, and part of the pushback we saw with Trump, and uh, dare I say, um, uh, we like to say the B word Brexit, uh, that, that both of these, what they shared in some part was a pushback against globalization, um, was an embrace of certain forms of nationalism and ethno-nationalism, which I think in both let's take the United Kingdom and the United States different as they are, I think that those beasts um, were, were not really allowed to be heard for a long time. So if you take the US, I mean, we've talked about the differences here um, between, in a sense, two tribes. Um, you can call them many things. You can call them blue and red. Uh, I just like to call them liberal and conservative or liberal and nationalist. But you will always put nationalists in the conservative bracket there. You won't put it in the liberal one. Liberals find it very difficult to talk about nationalism in the United States. And, and I think that's interesting. What we've seen in the United States is, is, is basically liberals have been traumatized by Trump and Trumpism, and they still are. Um, that's partly what I meant by their um, desire for normalcy uh, or their desire for decency when they look to Biden. Um, Trump deeply dramatized what it meant to be liberal. And one of the ways he did that was by pushing one of the key levers of a populist leader, which is not just the attacks on the elite, it is that you have to constitute an alternative reality for your base. And Trump did it brilliantly. And it still exists for those people who are in complete denial that Biden won the presidency. All the key Republican contenders for the presidential uh, leadership and the Republican slate all are saying, that the election was stolen. This is all feeding into that alternative reality, which itself, of course, is undergirded by the awfully toxic mix of social media and conspiracy theory, which is driving so much of what we are now um, considering to be American reality. And I think that that clash of realities is at the heart of Trumpism. Um, I don't know whether there's a similar one happening in your country, I won't speak for that, but I, I think this is a, a fascinating moment. And it's another way of thinking about this idea of, you know, a Wizard of Oz, Oz moment when a new kind of reality is being revealed. We're at a kind of interregnum. Those of you who know your uh, Marxist theory know that that's a word that refers to the, the ending of one world system and the birthing of another. It's a painful period. That's what we're going through. There's lots of things you could use to describe this new, new world that's coming. I'm not sure what the right language is, but it's certainly a fascinating moment to observe all of this. Yeah. Phil, do you want to come back on any of that? Thank you very much, Liam. Thanks for that. Did you uh, want to sure. Come yeah, briefly, mm. if I may, yeah. I suppose. Um, so on the metaphor of the Wizard of Oz, um, I suppose what was revealed was the, um, I it's important, I suppose, to be specific here, because I think what was revealed in that moment in which um, the American capital was left, um, you know, effectively undefended and was overrun by the protesters, the Trumpian protesters, it was that America, American power and the, the symbol of American democratic government was, it was a deeply humiliating moment um, for the US state um, and for the US conception of itself. And I think it's that, the reduction of America on the world stage, the fact that it has um, been exposed to be um, so deeply dysfunctional that the kinds of scenes that you might expect in countries that are far less stable, politically stable, um, that we saw that in um, the country that we all turn to and expect to resolve our problems, um, 
I think that was what was so shocking about it. So I'm not sure, um, I mean, there's a limit to every metaphor. And I wouldn't wish to suggest that the Wizard of Oz metaphor that I deployed means that um, we've seen reality and that now we no longer live kind of in the world of mirages, but now live in kind of uh, in the world of the real and that everything is visible and we can easily understand what's happening and that we can you know, confront with sober senses the world as it is. I, unfortunately, I don't think that's the case, despite the fact that the... Um, uh, the, we saw the kind of the humiliation of American, the functioning of American government. So I think that this issue of um, that, uh, the fragmentation between different worldviews, I think, is part of the problem. Um, and Liam mentioned the kind of rea the idea of um, the, that Trumpian supporters inhabit, that the U.S. election was stolen from them. Um, it mirrors very... Um, you know, very starkly and strikingly, the parallel universe that um, liberals have, you know, inhabited under Trump, that the Russians determined the US election. And there are many parallels, um, I think, you know, today with um, what's happening with uh, Corona, um, with the rise of vaccine nationalism, and also disputes over the vaccine in the EU, and in Britain, um, all of this indicates, I think, that unfortunately, there's a miasma of illusion and confusion and an unwillingness to um, to attempt to kind of broker some of those illusions. So when I use the Wizard of Oz, I, I suppose I should be specific about what I meant. I don't think, unfortunately, it means that we're out of the realm of illusion, far from it. I think in many, in some ways, we're more kind of, we grip our illusions even more tightly. Um, but nonetheless, that American power there is, I think, um, a realization, at least in some world capitals, that American power cannot be relied upon the way that you could have relied upon it in the past. And this seems to me to be, if we look to our own affairs and we don't rely on outsiders to resolve them for us, that seems to me to be potentially positive, though whether or not it plays out in the long run, obviously, is um, we'll have to see. And that's an open question. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm going to take a question or two from the audience and then I'll come back to the speaker so you can take a little break now and, and see what comes our way. Um, it's uh, Joe, is it? Yeah, are you there? Yeah. Is that Hi. right? Is it Joe? Am I right? Yeah, Joe. That's fine. Yeah, Joe. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I just had a, a few questions. Um, you talking about that we don't um, look to the US anymore to resolve our problems. But one of the things that strikes me is that there is now a real separation between political um, influence and cultural influence. And um, um, I think that the cultural influence from America seems stronger um, and that to a certain extent, the, the powers that be in our country um, look to America for um, cultural backup and I just wondered what the speakers thought about that you know particularly with the kind of um, Black Lives Matters and the whole thing about Floyd George influencing race in this country even though our experience of racism in this country is very very different to the experience in America. Um, I also want I wasn't quite sure what um, Liam was saying about ethno-nationalism and I just wondered if he could clarify what that what that means. Are you, are you talking about the kind of idea of um, Trumpian being very white nationalistic or are you, are you talking about something else um, entirely? And um, the um, birthing of a new world order, big question I know, but um, I, I didn't get any sense from any of the speakers that there was a birthing of a new world order. I just got a sense that there was a dying of an old and, and nothing new was coming out of that. Thanks, yeah, that's a really good point. And um, I'll, I, I, we'll come back to, uh, the speakers could kind of think how they'd like to respond to some of these um, uh, um, contributions. That would be great. We'll take a few more and come back to you. Chrissy, you're next. Would you like to unmute and uh, yeah. brilliant, lovely. Okay, hi, yeah, I'd like to ask the, um, the speakers um, to, to try and dig into if they could the relationship between uh, domestic and international um, affairs in terms of America, because um, I find I'm finding something really quite confusing in that issue. 
because when I think back to the immediate post-Cold War era, it seemed as though virtually all the presidential candidates came into office promising to withdraw America from the rest of the world, to, to, to bring politics home, and then found themselves being driven overseas, seemingly reluctantly, by their sort of uh, inability to do anything much about the domestic problems that America was facing. Uh, whereas that seems to have changed into something quite strange, really, in that when we get a presidential candidate making that sort of promise, that is seen as outrageous and ridiculous. Um, and, and, and rather than, rather than um, um, international intervention being something that is um, entered into reluctant, seemingly reluctantly, it seems to be that this is a driving, a driving force behind what's going on. So it's, it's seen not so much as, um, 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 well, or it's seen more as a, as a duty, a, the, the duty to protect, the sort of uh, responsibility to protect, to, to sort of um, <clears throat> to look after all of the all of the suffering people around the world, to to uh, look after the environment. Um, and I, I just simply, I want to try and understand that relationship a little bit better. Yeah. That's great, thanks. Yeah, that, that's really interesting because actually that is possibly the, the biggest difference of it between um, Trump and Biden is that Trump is, was resolutely not about, um, you know, the duty to protect. It was all about America first. And um, it was that, um, you, you know, a... Um, Underneath the rhetoric of Biden, can can um, can um, America um, kind of return to that um, that that kind of moral position in the world where it is um, the power that everyone looks to to solve the problems of the world? I'd like to actually um, just maybe ask the speakers if they'd like to come back on any of the questions that were raised there. Um, there's a question really about. Um, about cultural influence and that seems, you know, whether that seems to be dominating now. And there was a particular question, I think, to, to Liam as well about to explain what you meant by ethno-nationalism. And um, maybe that'll take us into the area of thinking about that idea of white nationalism that was very much um, um, very prominent um, and associated with Trump. Um, and is, I guess, part of the, um, of, of Biden is pushing back against that, I, I, I guess. Um, but maybe Cheryl, can I come to you and say, is there anything you'd like to come back on any of those questions that were that were put or comments or anything you'd like to come back on um, anything that the other speakers have said? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, Joe had a whole list of questions there, but um, the point about political and cultural, you know, this has been they've been kind of merged and um, mixed up and the kind of culture has been politicized and politics has kind of um, been pulled into the realm of the cultural through the culture wars and everything um, for, for, for quite a long time now. And, and I do think that in a sense, like both um, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump um, did fail to make the changes that I was kind of pointing out in terms of um, kind of really kind of resolving to solve any of the, the problems that um, domestically that America was facing um, because they focused on the cultural sphere, because they pulled all the politics or they kind of, they used the prism of, um, of the cultural sphere. And I do, I think that uh, Bernie Sanders in 2016, like there was, there was an opportunity there, um, but then he got kind of sucked into all the, all of the identity politics stuff and, and, um, and it, it all became again, a cultural issue. And with Trump, you know, like he basically pulled the entire White House in, onto Twitter and it just became, you know, the whole thing became became a culture war. So um, there wasn't any kind of real political discussion or no public sphere. It's just, you know, it's, that's been shrinking for, for a long time. So I think the a lot of the failures 
are down to the fact that you know um, culture has kind of taken over politics in in many ways, and um, you know the Black Lives Matter thing really is a just another example of that. You know, I, I don't know like the way I know that some people have kind of framed that in terms of the British experience of it as an Americanization, but um, I I don't. I don't think, I think we kind of let ourselves off the hook a bit if we blame America for all the things, you know, that are happening here. And I think it's a really bigger thing. It's about, it's about reckoning with the past or having any kind of sense of the future. So um, you talked about the other, another of Joe's question was about the birthing of a new world order. I don't think anything is going to be burst because we don't have any idea of where we want to go like we're, we're afraid of the future in so many ways we're afraid of the future and we the reason we're afraid of the future is because we don't understand or we don't want to reckon with the past we don't have any kind of historical understanding or kind of any sense of of history um everything is about now you know it's about the present and um you know that the um, everyone's been talking about the Adam Curtis documentary and like the the most important point that he makes in that documentary um, as, as well as actually making the point I think of it um, that that culture is what has sucked all the life out of politics right? he he also talks about history and um, and having stories to tell about the future and you can't create any stories about the future and your direction, the direction you want to travel in, unless you have a sense of where you've come from, like you have to have stories that you can tell about the past. And most of the stories about our past, about the American past, have been based on the nation, right? about the, the national story. Um, and so how can you move forward when nationalism is, you know, not something that you're willing to um, to kind of trade with or, or to tell stories about or to you know kind of create any unity around in your population and uh, you know as a historian I don't want historians to go back you know to create national stories it's you know that that is something from the past but we need another story and I don't know what that story could be but we definitely in order to have a future we need to start thinking historically and not just projecting all of our present day concerns and worries into the past. So. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Jacob, I wondered if you had anything to come back on those questions in terms of, I mean, I think it was Joe made the point um, that far from it, or someone made the point that far from it being a sort of uh, interregnum that is, you know, a birth of something new, that there is, and you talked about it a lot, a real sense of exhaustion and the end of something, but what, with nothing else in sight? And, um, maybe that thought or anything else you'd like to, to come back on? Yeah, the, 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 the question raised about, um, the, sort of the, about the cultural issue and the degree to which um, uh, America has lost its leadership, but there's still this feeling that, or lost its international leadership, but still there's this feeling that, uh, politicians in the West still sort of orient their politics according to what seem to be American cultural concerns. I think that gets at something which is that it's definitely right that the political and perhaps above all like economic order that undergirded American supremacy and that everyone looked as Phil very well put, looked to America for leadership and it sort of was the backstop to that whole order. So that's floated away. Um, and there's a kind of desperate attempt across lots of Western, Western nations to find new modes of exercising authority, new claims to cultural and political legitimacy. And I mean, America is, I, would, don't, I, I take the point well made by Cheryl that we shouldn't for sort of blame all our problems on America. And people are experimenting with different things. And one thing that's seemed to offer a fair amount of uh, moral legitimacy, of course, has been the sort of re-racializing of politics and the Black Lives Matter moment. Um, and of course, the sort of emotionalization of politics, which of course we're seeing play out with the um, Megan versus the royal family scenario, which is a very blatant and obvious attempt to lay claim to uh, moral authority by uh, broadcasting your emotional credentials. So there's definitely an attempt, while like to to find new sources of authority now that what now that there's a wider spread agreement, even if only in private, that the political and economic order that the world used to rest on that that's all crumbling and doesn't have the, the legs to, 
so that you can't stand uh, a world order on that basis anymore. But it's obviously, I mean, those things I've talked about, emotional legitimacy or appeals to race, they're all like very brittle and uh, they're, they're not going to form solid bases for authority. And so Cheryl's point is very well, well made about the fact that without any vision about what we're going to do positively in the future, these uh, attempts are, are, are doomed to fail and nothing, nothing will come of it. I'll end briefly, and maybe I should promise to go and watch The Wizard of Oz again and never speak of it. But the, 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 the point I think about The Wizard of Oz metaphor is that they, the, in terms of the narrative of the film, reality isn't revealed when they pull back the curtain and find that there's the guy without, um, who's just pulling the levers. Reality is revealed when they realize they have to stop kidding to themselves and she has to wake up, right? And then she can go back home. And so it's like the, the, the idea that there was some grand force pulling the strings behind the curtain was, was an illusion, was in a sham. And people themselves have to sort of go off and figure out what it means and how they can wake up from it and take control of their, of their lives again. And that, 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 I mean, if there's a positive moral to draw out of it, they're all very, very right that it's not that we suddenly see things, but maybe it suggests to some people that we do need to go and work out more seriously on how we can take responsibility for, for the world order or, or, or for our countries. I'd, yeah, thanks there, Jacob. I, I'd like, to, I, I'm not going to bring um, Phil and Liam in yet. I'm going to ask you to hold fire because I'm sure you've got plenty you'd like to come back on on that and uh, invite two more speakers from the floor. Uh, Sheila, um, do you want to come in and, and contribute to this? I just had um, a question from the panel, for, for the panel. I, I have, um, I'm listening and learning. I don't have a great deal of expertise about the United States, but obviously fascinated by it. Um, but it, it strikes me that one of Trump's promises was around the idea of reindustrializing the United States and really looking at labor and work and the economy, um, making things, you know, a lot of the language around um, industrial strategies. And whilst it was all crazy, I was interested sort of four years ago, five years ago to think, well, I wonder what he'll do with that. And it turns out nothing, but it strikes me that that is in any nation at any point, that is actually something that's doable. I know all the culture, the cultural stuff has got in the way, but I just wondered what the, the, the experts on the panel thought about this whole thing about the economy, which we're, distracted from as we as we ourselves engage in the cultural debates uh, I think that's my main question but thank you it's really interesting yeah thanks you had a great question Mo um yeah thanks all really interesting contributions um I, I sort of liked what you were saying Jacob which I think you were saying the change from Trump to Biden is sort it's almost like business as usual, but with a respectable veneer on it, a less tacky veneer on hiding some of the problems um, that Amer the American economy faces, particularly, I think the you, you alluded to or referred to the, the decline in economic dynamism and almost like, you know, ca capitalism's run out of steam and all, all the kind of promises that that held. So I'm just really curious to, um, to understand how much the, the, I suppose, the COVID crisis and this kind of continual accumulation of debt and the burdening of the burgeoning of, of the American state in terms of um, kind of managing that debt, how, what that's going to do to kind of the last vestiges of American liberalism as, as I see it, and, and kind of related to that really, I mean, Okay, so so you know we're all happy to strip back the veneer and see that this America, this myth of America, kind of de Tocqueville's um, democracy in America and the, all the promise that held that was a sort of a myth that kept us going. But when we are faced with quite a liberal times, I would say where we've got so much kind of authoritarian creep from the new oligarchs at big tech um, to kind of cancel culture to all, all the stuff that you know that we've talked about how important is that myth of america even if it was part myth um to um kind of defending a liberal outlook that's it yeah great yeah good question i'm going to come back to um and, and invite um uh, liam and phil liam first maybe if you'd like to go first 
to come back on any of those um, comments or questions or anything else you'd like to, to put forward. I mean, and a rough summary really is, there was questions on authority and authoritarianism, um, the culture wars, and the promises, the Trump's promises, I think someone talked about the, the promise to withdraw America from uh, foreign adventures and interventions, and also to, to rebuild the economy and to reindustrialize and get America back to work. Um, there's also the, the question of the economy and, 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 and real things like debt um, and, and America's economic standing. Um, lots of stuff there. Anything you'd like to come back on, Liam? And then I'll come to you, Phil. Well, there is a lot there. It's been great to listen to it as well and, 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 and hear what people are thinking. Um, one, one thing that has occurred to me just in listening is that whilst there's a diversity of opinion here, I, I also think it's a little narrow in some ways. I mean, certainly most of us have been jumping all over Joe Biden to say he's either a shill or a shell and, and you know, uh, another version of Donald Trump. I don't think he's another version of Donald Trump at all. And I hope I wasn't heard to say that. Um, I think it matters that Joe Biden was elected. I think it matters that Donald Trump wasn't. Um, I don't think it would have made... Um, I, th I think it makes a great difference to the America going forward. Um, but I think that, and I also think that Joe Biden has done some very good things in the last few days. I think that the stimulus bill is quite a terrific feat. Um, just to look at it and say, well, it didn't do this and it didn't do that is way too easy. There's amazing stuff in there. Um, you know, protections for union jobs, um, credits for children, all, all kinds of terrific stuff in there. Um, and yes, bits of it didn't get across the line that the progressives wanted to see, but if that's all we're going to talk about, we're really missing the bigger picture. Also, he's helped steer the Voting Rights Act, um, you know, uh, towards some degree of success. Now, it will collapse in the Senate, but that's not the point. There is a difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. There is a difference between the nationalist conservatives and the liberal progressives. Those are very big camps that I'm painting, but I do think there are differences. Unfortunately, a lot of that difference is cultural, which is what we keep coming back to. But I would use another word to describe the difference. Um, I would use the word race. Um, Donald Trump, when he was elected, was described by the uh, black intellectual Tanishi Coates in the front page of the Atlantic magazine as America's first white president. And I think Coates nailed it. That's exactly what Trump was. Um, because what Trump did, at least in, in living memory, um, he was the first president to say that it's OK to be white and it's OK to be um, um, out there about your whiteness as an identity. Uh, it's not a neutral identity. Um, it's not invisible through its sheer hegemony. Um, it's a salient force. And Charlottesville was one of the first proofs of that. And we've had many since. Put another way, I think that 6th of January, if you were to look at this and ask, you know, what was that all about? I think that was a race riot. I think that was a white race riot, essentially. And one of the things that fascinates me is that American journalists refuse to use that frame, including the liberals, because they are just too nervous about calling out whiteness in that way. Um, I, think, I think that the, the question of how what we understand by whiteness is absolutely at the center of both the economic, political, and cultural questions that are being put forward. Thanks very much, Liam. Um, Cheryl, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you. Uh, <laughs> That I on this, but not now. I'm going to go to Phil first, but I am going to come to you because I know this is an area that you, you're writing about, right? But I'll, I'll let, just hold fire there because, um, Phil, is there anything you'd like to come back on? Sure. Um, just to, um, um, ex I guess, uh, agree with Jacob about the Wizard of Oz. This Wizard of Oz metaphor is clearly going to run and run, and I'm definitely going to take you further. <laughs> Um, and of course, Jacob's right, because at the end, um, Dorothy wakes up. Um, she has to wake up out of the whole dream, not just the realizing that the Wizard of the Great and Powerful Oz is, in fact, um, a, you know, kind of uh, an old, a bumbling old fool with um, lots of kind of um, tricks and, um, you know, cranky machinery. So, however, the precondition for Dorothy waking up, returning to the real world, is um, that she realizes that there is no, that this kind of enormous and impressive source of authority, uh, the Wizard of Oz, which the whole story was about kind of getting to the end of that, to getting him to solve your problems for you. And she realizes that he can't. Um, when the magic of Oz disappears, um, that is the precondition 
for her kind of uh, leaving the dream. So I suppose I would, you know, say that perhaps um, the stripping away of the kind of the illusions of the magic doesn't mean that we've exited the dream, but perhaps it's a precondition for exiting the dream. So just to underscore and agree with what Jacob was saying, I think, in fact, the metaphor um, perhaps says, um, you know, it's more felicitous and successful than I than I thought initially. So thanks to Jacob for drawing it out. I only wanted to quickly touch upon something that Sheila said about the fact that um, Trump kind of, um, I mean, there's a lot to dig into, but I thought I'd pick this up on industrialization, that Trump kind of drew attention to questions of work and industry and labor in a way that hadn't been done for a very long time. I think that's true. And I think to some degree that has been locked, it has been locked into, um, American political culture as a result, because what's striking um, and working class interests as well, because what's striking, there isn't, there wasn't in terms of Trump's confrontation with China, that had already begun under the Obama administration, the pivot to China had happened, that geopolitical pivot had already happened under the Obama administration. I think what's different was that Trump made it far more visible to working class concerns. He connected it to working class concerns about deindustrialization, about um, being overextended in the Middle East, about fighting wars that weren't in America's interest, um, about kind of carrying the burden of the world at the expense of um, America's interest. And so he's plugged those geopolitical concerns into class politics in a way that they hadn't been before. The pivot to China was an elite thing rather than something which parlayed into a politics of class. Um, however, nothing came of the, you know, the questions of industrialized, reindustrialization and labor and work, nothing came of it, as Sheila said. And in terms of his domestic policy it was more or less very traditional um, GOP Republican style, you know, lots of tax cuts for the rich and very little else. Um, so that said, I think we will see some reindustrialization in scare quotes, both you know, throughout the Western world as a result of the reshoring of certain supply chains, the need to kind of build up capacity for critical infrastructure. Um, you know, there will be some of that, um, without a doubt, I think, will be spurred on by the experience of the pandemic and also by the shift towards a greater willingness on, by states to spend on public infrastructure. But there won't be reindustrialization on the scale that was kind of dramatized by Trump um, or the idea that, um, you know, suddenly the West is going to become the industrial powerhouse of the world the way that it was once upon a time. Um, and that, I think, is because the point is that we are industrialized societies and that the crisis, the kind of uh, well, the difficulties that we confront are those of being societies that haven't resolved um, the problems of being industrial societies, the problems of abundance. I mean, we produce industrially as a manufacturing power, for instance, Britain produces far more than it did when it was the workshop of the world. And that's because we use far more technology and we're far more productive now. So even though most of the British economy is service sector, it's still far more productive in industrial terms. And that reflects the use of technology and productivity. So the reindustrialization um, even if we start manufacturing a bit more PPE and a few more ventilators in Britain, rather than relying on other countries to provide them, that isn't going to lead to um, a significant restructuring or rebalancing of the economy away from a service sector economy to industrial economy. Um, and that's because the, the crisis, I think, um, it runs deeper than that. And we haven't, and it's still in many ways, I think this is, we're still kind of um, living, we're still living in the, wake of the industrial revolution and the failure to resolve the problems that come from the industrial revolution. Societies of abundance um, and societies that are unable to realize the promise of that abundance um, with the result that you have um, vast swathes of the of people living, you know, kind of working either unemployed, long term unemployment or living or working in kind of effectively unproductive dead end service sector jobs because they're not connected to a functioning, the functioning, the actual functioning of the economy. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Cheryl um, and Jacob, I'll come briefly to you if you've got anything you'd like to um, anything you'd like to respond to and then we'll go back out because there's a, a couple more questions I think from the floor um, and then we'll have to come back and do some summing up so but let's start with um, uh, Jacob or, or Cheryl either of you who wants to come in and um, respond to anything that's been said 
Well, I wanted to add a little bit more to the uh, uh, the analogy of the Wizard of Oz because oh, no. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> no, but this actually I mean it is so fitting for our times because um, it, it it was written in the late nineteenth century as a parable on populism right so it was about the uh, kind of glittering city that was a kind of appealing to the to the farm folk but that actually they needed to take matters into their own hand I mean she wakes up from the dream that's about her coming home you know that's what matters after all um, so I think that you know you can look at lots of the kind of analogies with that novel um, in terms of what I really wanted to come back on though was Liam's argument about um, January 6th being a race riot because I mean you probably would have picked up from my opening comments that I don't think that that's the case and I you know I do think it has been exaggerated in the press um, and the framing of it as, as a race riot um, I think that is I mean I can I can understand why you would do that um, because Trump's kind of embrace of uh, whiteness or whatever you know it it is it's just another strand of identity politics and it is a kind of um it is a problem i think in any kind of sense to have that kind of um racial uh, racialization of politics in a way but i think that that you know you can strip you need to strip away the layers and see what what is really going on there um and i think that the what we need to kind of move to now is to understand how actually the response to the january 6th uh, riot could in the end be end up being more problematic than the riot itself. So um, a couple of uh, journalists, um, uh, Michael Tracy and Glenn Greenwald, have, have wrote immediately after this about you know making parallels with 9/11 and saying that you know what's going to happen is like this raft of, of anti-terror legislation and it's going to all kind of be put in place. And even though it was seen as temporary um, in 2001, it's um, it's become permanent, like the Patriot Act and all of that. So they were saying like we need to be careful and in fact some of the um the more progressive uh, congress uh, um, um men and women have um have said yes we need to avoid that kind of direct and i so i don't actually think that that's going to happen what they were warning about i don't think that's going to happen because um because there is a sense that we need to avoid that you know we need to learn from that lesson um but instead what's happening i think in this kind of push for um, an anti-terrorism campaign. It's like, it's not a crackdown per se in kind of uh, legislative terms, but I think there is a kind of cultural campaign to delegitimize um, conservatives or especially Trump supporters, you know, which 74 million or something Americans voted for Trump. And um, I think this is much more dangerous actually than any kind of, um, um, legislation that is going to, you know, remove civil liberties, which you could actually oppose and kind of campaign against, because this becomes like a just in the air, like a delegitimization. And calling them racists is, um, you know, it worked for, you know, that's what basically for four years the Brexit voters got right that they were racist, and so you, it becomes impossible to speak in public if you support Trump or if you support um, Brexit. So, so that kind of um, that kind of chilling of the and, and delegitimization of a political of your political opponents in that way really is you know more of a problem. And um, I, I was looking at uh, you know kind of recent. So I mean I, the whole potato head thing or whatever you know that's all going on. But a recent survey found that fifty percent, like half of liberals, think that any business executive who was found to have donated in a private capacity to a Trump campaign should lose their job. So that's kind of worrying. And I think that that kind of um, the ability to be able to discuss things and to um, accept that people have different political views to you is something that we, you know, it's basically democracy. And so that's why I think it's really important to, you know, defend those values, those democratic values, um, and to and to stop that kind of cultural degradation or smearing of the of opponents so that they're so that free speech is is lost. You know, that is that's in the air, that's the culture. And then what happens is that um, liberals tend to to deny that that's even happening. Cancel culture doesn't exist, you know, like free speech isn't a problem. Nobody 
um, nobody is is censoring anyone, you know, like there was lots written on Biden had nothing to do with with Mr. Potato Head, whatever, like it's, um, it's or the Dr. Seuss thing, you know, it's like all of those things. It's not about kind of policy and politics and legislation, which would make it much more rational and, and um, something that you could actually oppose. It becomes a kind of cultural thing and about identities. And then it just is divisive. Like that is the problem. It's just divisive. And there won't ever be any kind of national unity or story or, get, you know, ability to move on from that. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on and bring in um, one more. We've got one more person who wants to speak from the floor. And then after that, I'm going to come back out and, and ask you, the speakers, please, to, to kind of sum up in a, in a couple of minutes, if they can each, um, answer the questions that are out there and, and, and sort of sum up in two or three minutes each. And I'll come back to you in reverse order. So I'm going to start with you, Cheryl. But first of all, we're going to hear from Phil. Phil, hi, do you want to unmute? Uh, yes, hope I am unmuted. Um, thanks very much, great discussion, really enjoyed it, um, uh, or have been enjoying it. Um, one of the themes has been this uh, one of sort of unmasking and things becoming a bit clearer, uh, perhaps to others in the world or within America itself. I want to sort of suggest a sort of a, a, a compliment to that in that there's perhaps some scope for some new some new masking, some new camouflaging of the problems, because I take the general sentiment that none of the fundamental underlying problems of American decline are going to disappear. But it, it seems to me there have been some changes, not to do with the, the, the shift, the, the move from Trump to Biden so much, but some objective changes in the world in the last, particularly last four or five years, which can perhaps paper up some of the sense of fragmentation and decline. And, and certainly, uh, there are issues in which there seems to be much more of a, a coherence and cohesiveness within the elite than there would have been in, in the past, which goes against the whole idea of, you know, a very, a very uh, partisan uh, political um, uh, uh, political um, practice. I mean, the three things I'm thinking about, and I'm sure there are many others. One is, um, or the three developments which which have cohered things in some ways. One is the rise of China, which is an, ob an objective thing. I think Phil's just uh, mentioned that and it's been mentioned a bit, but that, you know, is something now which is perceived by the, uh, the whole American establishment as a real problem for themselves. They can see that China has moved ahead in number of technologies and so on. And there's been a bit of a, a shake up then to see that, uh, you know, things can't go on in that same way. So that's one area in which Many people have commented there's clear bipartisanship between what went on in the last four years and what Biden is promising in terms of China bashing. So that, that gives one coherence. Second is um, uh, the environmental agenda, which seems to have moved on in the last few years as well. Again, a consensus issue, which seems to be accepted. You know, there's, there's nobody now really challenging the idea of new, new green, uh, you know, green new deals or whatever, you know, big business. Uh, you know, sections of the Republican Party, as well as the Democrats, seem relatively united. Obviously, there's a bit of, uh, you know, you'll always have a bit of uh, disagreement, but generally that is a, a cohering um, uh, possibility. Uh, and the third one is, is the, the very, um, uh, and this thing relates to the big, huge stimulus package, which again has, you know, not engendered much opposition. There hasn't been any sort of Tea Party type revolt against this. I mean, the Republicans voted against it, but generally it's not something uh, which has polarized society. There seems to be a great consensus around the need for that stimulus, which to me is uh, a result of um, the fact that the genie of is out of the bottle, not so much in terms of Trump or Trumpism, but in terms of the fact that there were those uh, people who did vote for Trump, and even more of them, as Cheryl has said, who voted for Trump a second time, uh, and that sense of restiveness uh, uh, amongst the American people uh, with the American establishment, that is much more out in the open and that has created a certain uh, consensus amongst the American elite as well to deal with that, which I think is why we're seeing this sort of open acceptance of welfareism, you know, handing out money to people, uh, the, the other sort of measures which are included in the, in, in the stimulus package. So uh, I, I'm sure there are other chain as well, but I'll end it there. But I'm just saying, as against the general theme of unmasking, uh, it seems there's areas in which the, you could have new masks, new camouflages on American problems uh, through this, what seems to be presumably a temporary 
uh, bipartisanship on a number of objective issues. And that seems to be uh, is a striking feature for me. I don't know how long it will last, may fragment quite quickly, but it does give something which I think we should uh, not take note of, which is different to the, the, the type of politics we saw during the Trump years. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're going to, um, I'm going to ask the speakers really to, to kind of summarize where they are, what their um, closing thoughts. Um, and in doing so, maybe respond to some of the questions and the comments and contributions that have been made from the floor that, um, that, that they want to, if there's something they'd like to pick up on. And as I said, I'm going to start in reverse order. So it's beginning with, um, with Cheryl. Cheryl, would you like to come back then? And, and give us your final take. Um, yeah, that, that was a really interesting contribution there from Phil um, on the remasking. I mean, I think, I mean, I haven't thought about it very much, but the, the, the idea that I mentioned about equity, this seems to be something that's being discussed a lot more, equity rather than equality. And um, it's something that I want to look into more, but I mean, most people have probably seen the, the kind of baseball fence with the three people standing, like the way that it's explained is three people standing, looking over a baseball fence. And if they're all given boxes to stand on at the same height, then that's equality. But if, the, if one is short and the other's tall, then that's obviously not going to be, um, it's not gonna help the short person if they still can't see over the fence. So they need a bigger box. And so that's the way of kind of approaching um, policy in this sense and it's using education a lot as well and um, and I think that it is in a, in a way a, a kind of um, a method of of masking inequalities um, and and the kind of stepping back from the aim of equality for all which was you know a, a, an American value uh, a founding value um, and you know American values um, were forged in its revolution in the 18th century and um, you know it was a huge achievement so they fought against a uh, America fought against a global empire um, in the name of liberty and for the principles of equality and justice and and since then you know American citizens have breathed life into those principles um, by establishing universal suffrage for all citizens and by you know fighting continually for the freedoms that were set down in the Bill of Rights so social movements from the abolitionists through to the the suffragettes to the civil rights movement you know these have all held America to its promise um, and throughout the 19th century and most of the 20th century the US has been an animated by this kind of liberal optimism and a sense of its own exceptionalism but this period of liberal optimism is over um, I think it died with the certainties of the Cold War and one of the many ironies of American history is that the belief that the United States was immune from those historical laws which set the path for other nations um, was only exposed as myth, just as um, belief in the power of historical laws dissipated um, generally globally. Um, and I think just to uh, comment on Mo's uh, question about um, the myth of America, I, you know, there's no going back, it's been exposed as a myth. I don't think anyone believes it in the myth of America anymore. Um, but there, new, there can be new ways of kind of reformulating it. So I've written about um, Hamilton, the musical, which has been like a massive success. And somehow that musical has managed to fuse the values of the founding with the reality of um, America today, like the life in uh, the diverse America of today, and using kind of identity politics as its kind of vehicle to talk about all of the American founding values. So, you know, there may be a way to kind of reshape that myth that's more inclusive, um, you know, but I don't know, again, that's, a, that's in culture. Can it happen in politics? I don't know. But I do think it's about time that we start holding America to its promise again, and particularly that Americans start holding America to its promise again, and, and not to allow the new elites to distract or to divert us away from the nation's democratic and revolutionary inheritance. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you very much. 
And I'm going to go um, now to Jacob and ask you for uh, a final summary. Yeah, sure. The, the great discussion. Th thanks to everyone who's contributed and um, shone a lot of light on things. I think I'll start with uh, the e economics question and, and the question of the, the stimulus, right? So, I mean, I feel probably very right that it uh, coheres some, uh, America to some degree. I mean, I just want some things in the stimulus bill, right? Um, uh, Ten million dollars for gender programs in Pakistan, um, a massive subsection on horse racing integrity, including laws against drugging horses, um, uh, uh, funding to address gender inequality in statues, one hundred ninety-three million dollars for federal HIV workers stationed abroad to buy new cars. It's like all the typical kind of pork barrel nonsense that you find in American politics full stop and I've, it's, it's not like address Phil's of course not suggesting it does but it doesn't address anything um fundamental in in American political economy which is still beset by uh a combination I guess but some of the things that uh, Phil Dunliffe has talked about in terms of not being able to get democratic uh, handle on the possibilities opened up by contemporary technologies and all the rest of it um and I, I, I look to people who've written such as on, on issues about reigniting dynamism here, but it's like it, the solution that's being kind of offered is a mixture of printing loads of money and spending it in some arcane ways and some relatively straightforward ways, such as handing out uh, checks, but is kind of premised on the idea that it will no one will really have to pay for this because we'll just inflate, the, the, the central bankers of the world have got together and decided we'll just inflate all of the debt away um, and, and that'll be fine. And uh, one of the things I think very different this time around is the historically very low power of, of workers to potentially negotiate salary rises in line with the general inflation. So I, I think there's a real danger of this approach has been sketched out. So it'll just increasingly immiserate people, even as the uh, powers that be in, inflate the, the debt away. And that stores up problem. That brings me to the, I, I, I guess, the central point that um, Phil talked about in his contribution just then, which is the, the remasking of things. And I guess my opening speech tried to allude to the fact that we've been trying to find new dress for certain um, American ideals, and that's a big part of the Biden project. I'm um, a little bit more skeptical maybe about the possibility of, of what, or rather what is stored up when we dress things up in, um, in, in, in the ways that I've outlined, whether that's to do with uh, race or critical theory or the uh, new sort of orientation around China. Um, that what, what, my question is what's stored up and what's in store for us when we sort of fail to get to grips with or address those problems. Um, I think I want to end on the, the point that uh, Liam raised about how important it was that uh, the, 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 the Trump, that they did vote against Trump and there was a mass mobilization of people, maybe not many people like excited about actually who they were voting for, but there was a big sort of democratic turnout and they got rid of Trump. And Trump had to be, I think even if you were the, a diehard Republican, you have even a diehard Trumpist, you, like Trump was a, a, an obstacle in many ways, not to just to sort of Democrat, the ideals embodied by the Democratic Party, but uh, wider things. And Trump had to be got rid of, and it's a positive thing that he did. Not least because what's been stirred up in this is uh, attention, as, as Phil Cundiff has said, to certain issues around reindustrialization or the plight of uh, large ways of the working class or whatever. And you see that played out in, um, in the sort of incredibly bizarre spectacle of Tucker Carlson speaking to a gigantic audience um, on American television, railing um, against the American oligarchy in a way that is, I mean, it, it, there, obviously there's a tradition of shock jocks and whatever in America, but this is like, there's a biting class, almost class consciousness to the stuff that comes out on Tucker Carlson. You can really be very suspicious about his motives or the people he's appealing to or the way, where this direction this is all going to go but something's kind of been stirred up there that Tucker Carlson is trying to take advantage of and that at least opens the door for more progressive forces to start talking about that. That's not to say any of this is right over the horizon because as the point has been well made that uh, without uh, stories to tell or ways of mobilizing people all of this is kind of moot and I, I don't have any prognostations as to what's going to come but there's been lots stirred up and things will settle and um i i wish we had some of us sort of our cousins from the states here to to encourage them to like use this moment to think and agitate and argue uh, creatively because a lot's been stirred up and there is 
uh, there are possibilities about, even if I'm a little bit skeptical that they're gonna resolve positively in the near future, but people have to seize it. Thanks very much, Jacob. Uh, Phil, would you like to round off? Yeah, thank you. So to echo the point about new forms of, um, I suppose, diverting your attention away from your own social problems, um, as Phil Mullen mentioned, of the camouflaging kind of aspect. I certainly think China will be one of them. I'll just, I mean, and I think I would only, I'd also uh, mention it with respect to British politics as well. So it's astonishing to, to me how much the British political elite um, are so concerned to have a piece of that action, um, trying to send warships to East Asia, trying to involve themselves in the kind of US standoff. Um, I mean, so kind of, you know, it's so vastly remote from anything that is um, meaningful to do with British interests and the attempt to kind of inflate the scale of British um, interest and um, stake in Hong Kong so that Britain kind of is now um, almost as if um, Britain was itself an Asia Pacific power. Astonishing. And I think so it goes to those questions of delusion. Um, and the power of those um, continuing illusions. So just when you think that the opportunities for reorientation um, and realism, you know, you think that the opportunities of Brexit should surely be political realism, and that is, um, to many, in many ways, that has not happened. Um, so yes, I think the, there will be um, that um, the rise of China will certainly be one way in which Western societies, the US in particular, will avoid its internal problems as as we saw in um, as we saw with the original cold war um and i'll finish on this note which is to restate the position with which i began about the um puncturing and de de the degrading of u.s authority and legitimacy so in the aftermath of the capitol hill riot it'll be that much more difficult for the u.s to issue a statement calling on parties to resolve their electoral dispute when there's an electoral um, you know, dispute in an Asian or African country. And this was picked up by many satirists on social media. You know, they said the kinds of things that um, the kinds of things that the US would normally tell other countries when, you know, their made government buildings are stormed in the midst of political crisis. Um, that's the things, you know, that other countries should be telling to the US now. So I think, you know, the fact that that has been punctured and that will be very difficult to restore. Um, and I think the positive or, you know, the potential positive thing that we can take from that is to look to, to look to ourselves, which is to say that the possibility of a greater sense of, to try and cultivate a greater sense of political self-sufficiency outside of the US and not to imagine that the US will be there um, as the backstop to our own problems, um, that it will be able to kind of come in and resolve our problems for us. Um, whatever Biden might say about America being back, I think that is the important lesson to take away from the um, from the end of the Trump era um, and the attempt to restore some kind of normalcy under Biden that it's um, it cannot be restored. Thanks, Liam. You get the last word. So, would you like to round us up, round off the discussion? I couldn't do that. It's been a very, very, very rich discussion, although there are some themes emerging, perhaps uh, this, uh, I mean, Phil, come back to this desire for normalcy, which I think we were talking about much earlier. Um, the themes of delusion and illusion seem to be quite rich running through much of what we've had to say this evening, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, let me just riff one last time on The Wizard of Oz. I'm the only person who hasn't picked up this wonderful metaphor, yeah. so I might as well have a go. As I was listening to it, and it's a terrific metaphor, actually, um, it spoke to me in a slightly different way, which is when I think of the Wizard of Oz, I see the wizard, that is the character, the figure of the wizard, as actually an example of a deeper archetype, which is the American con man, who goes back further into 19th century literature and culture. Um, Mark Twain wrote a, a novel called The Confidence Man, which was really the first clear kind of framing of that type, although you could see actors of him elsewhere. And he comes all the way through to the present day, but I, I see The Wizard of Oz as Baum paints him as one of the type. I mean, The Wizard of Oz, remember, was a carny man. He was a confidence man in a certain kind of way uh, before he flew off to Oz, if he did. Um, and then you can come all the way through some of my cultural heroes, um, 
Sergeant Belko, anyone? Anyone old enough to remember the sergeant? Um, but you would have to come through, it seems to me, and I'm trying really hard to tie things together here. Surely you'd have to come through to the cat in the hat. One of the greatest confidence figures in American culture. And isn't Dr. Zeus on our agenda tonight? So I know I'm painting quite an arc, but um, if that's the case, and I'm truly riffing off the top of my head now, if uh, the cat on the hat and uh, Trump is obviously the cat who, through his uh, craziness, kept us all captivated, um, then with his exit, it's as if the spell is broken, to use Phil's words, but that would also suggest that the missing parents were Joe and Kamala, right? And that they have now returned. The liberal parents are back in the house. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people are going to miss the cat. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Liam. Thanks. Uh, that's great. We've had um, Mr. Potato Head, the cat in the hat, Dr. Seuss, and the Wizard of Oz. It's, it's been a great discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and best of all, Sergeant Bilko. <laughs> yeah, I do remember. <laughs> so, you know, it's been a fantastic discussion. And, and I think that is um, a great way to end it. Uh, thank you for that, Liam. Um, I just really want to say now, because we've run over time, thank you very much to all our speakers.